Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Wednesday night it is time to go into the old archives. We are heading into the COVID trilogy, which I, of course, promised for a little while now. Have I been putting it off? Maybe just a little bit, because, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to get quite messy on this one. But tonight is part one of the COVID trilogy, the 2019-20 season. Not too far into the archives, uh, yeah, because we're just going a few years back. But, oh boy. It's going to be a bumpy ride over the next few episodes of Bustalgia, but we've done a season one in a while as well. It's been a, because they're usually our longest ones. I'm going to try, try my best to just trim a bit of the fat off the show so it doesn't end up a two-hour marathon, but there is a lot to talk about tonight on this one. Obviously, a season that gets cut short. Some little virus coming over from China and just ruining everything. Invoices, Dundee invoices, um, and all controversy around that, but yeah, we'll be diving into all the fun and frauds. But as you can see, though, tonight's team at the moment, so it's pending, there's a big question mark over it because Russell might appear. I don't know. He might be on. I've no, no heard from him. Um, but one of the other guys might be joining us as well. But as you see, it's myself and the wise man of the bus, uh, Canada's favourite Tim, Liam Greenlaw. Liam, how you doing, mate? Doing great, Phil. Getting over my Scotland hangover. We organised a wee bit of a party in Vancouver. Just saw Celtic guys basically watching the Scotland game and uh I we bit worse for the wear, but good is good today. Yeah, it's jump, um jump into the misery it was this season, huh? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I see it I want to say it ended well, but it, it never really ended technically. Uh obviously in the end, yeah, the, the, the record book show that Celtic won it all this season, but yeah, it's, it's a surreal season. I say with the next three episodes of nostalgia concentrating on this season. Obviously, the, the 10 in a row attempt will be episode two of this trilogy. Oh. And then the one after that will be Ange Postacoglu coming in and turning it around. But yeah, we're about to enter a very strange time for Celtic, for football, and for the world in general, because it's all about to go to shit, to put it lightly. But before we dive into that one, of course, I will just remind all the viewers to do all that good stuff. We'd appreciate it massively. And it helps out algorithm CSC. While William disappears, I think he's got to take a phone call. So that's well-timed by him. But of course, I'll just remind everybody, hit that like button. Obviously, pushes the uh, recommendations to the Boise bus to other yeah. people on YouTube. Oh, is that a false alarm, William? Is that not the phone call? No. Cool, man. Uh, obviously, get involved in our comment section tonight or leave comments after the video as well because, again, YouTube just loves active channels. So it helps us out again massively and pushes the name of the Boise Bus around YouTube even more. Obviously, you can share the link of the Boise Bus uh, far and wide on whatever social media happens to be your favorite. And uh, yeah, you can hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. What's stopping you from doing so? It only takes a second to do it. Remember, hit that bell notification and you will be reminded when the bus is on the road, and it is on the road quite a lot during the week. And, uh, of course, head over to piesports.com, use the code BUS1888, and get yourself a tasty treat, 12.5% off your order for your tasty pastries. And all that said and done, mm -hmm. Liam, seeing as you're on your own just now, there's nobody here other uh, than the team, do you want a wee trivia question to warm you up, to just get you, uh, get you going, mate? We'll come Thank back you. to the answers at the end. You know what Bust Alge like? has got to be a trivia question at the start of the show. There has to be. Of course. So, yeah, this season that we're going into, 2019-20, is the season that we signed Christopher Julian. £7 million we spent on him. Our noisy neighbours across the city also spent £7 million, allegedly, on a player as well, Ryan Kent. And funny enough, our centre-back signing outscored Ryan Kent this season. Hilarious. Absolutely Hilarious. Do you know the seven teams that uh, Christopher Julian scored against in all competitions? Seven goals he got. So uh, yeah. yeah, but that's yeah. the that is tonight's uh, question: is who um, who did Christopher Julian score the seven goals? Against? Yeah, he outscored the much celebrated Ryan Kent. But uh, yeah, of course, for those in the was in the chat as well, you get involved in that question, and we will come back to the answers at the end of. Joe, as I quickly send something through, because I see one of the other members of the bus might be joining us, so I will send the link to them, uh, and they might jump on. So, uh, yeah, because I don't know, I'd say, I don't know if Russell's appearing or not, but we'll just soldier on anyway. So, with that being said, I will now just fire through where the world was in 2019, the last year of normality before everything went down the swanee. Here we go, 2019, so yeah, the pre-season roundup. So yeah, as I normally do, I'll just fire through where the world of football was first and foremost, who were the big winners at the end of the 2018-19 season. So Champions League winners were Liverpool, they beat Tottenham Hotspur 2-0 in the final in Madrid, a stadium that we will be playing in 
in a few weeks' time when we play Atletico, because it was at Atletico Stadium, not the Bernabeu. Atletico had moved into a new stadium, the Metropolitana Stadium. So, uh, yeah, that hosted the final in 2019. The Europa League was held in Baku. Is that even in Europe? You know, Azerbaijan, it's quite a far way to go. But, yeah, Chelsea smashed Arsenal 4-0 or 4-1 in the final to lift the Europa League. Uh, and across the major leagues of Europe, uh, Manchester, there's no, there's no surprises across any of the major leagues. So this is the last year of normality before everything goes to shit in 2020. But, yeah, 2019, your big champions were... Manchester City won the English League. We were the champions in Scotland. Another treble, of course. In Spain, it was Barcelona. In Germany, it was Bayern Munich. In Italy, it was Juventus. In France, it was PSG. In Holland, it was Ajax. In Portugal, it was Benfica. As I say, no surprises across the board there in terms of who won what. And in terms of big transfers, where was the world of the transfers that summer? Who, who was the big movers and shakers? It was the summer that Eden Hazard, who is now a free agent, Moved from Chelsea to Real Madrid, which I say didn't amount to anything. A guy who we will be coming across very, very soon, Liam, Antoine Griezmann, swapped life at Atletico Madrid for Barcelona that summer. He's now back at Atletico Madrid. So I say we will be encountering him in a few weeks. At the time, Atletico Madrid replaced Antoine Griezmann with Joe Felix to Benfica. Uh, who now is no longer at Atletico Madrid neither. He's away to Barcelona. So maybe he'll end up back at Atletico in a few years, the way the cycle works. Ajax had just been to the semi-finals, the Champions League, two of their prize assets, Matthias De Ligt and Frankie de Jong, traded life in Amsterdam for Juventus and Barcelona, respectively. And incredibly, Harry Maguire, who is topical right now, became the most expensive defender in the world when he joined Manchester United for, I believe, 80 million quid. <laughs> Incredible, given that Virgil van Dijk was the uh, record holder before then. And uh, yeah, but it's a very topical right now. Harry Maguire, he uh, was causing some headlines last night as Connor comes in and joins us. Hello, Connor. Welcome along, sir. Hi, guys. How's it going? Thanks for jumping on. Jumping in last minute to save the day again. Oh, we're glad to see you, mate. God, this is a good season to talk about as well, because uh, especially how it ends and... Uh, some of the controversy, I'm sure we'll uh, have good fun laughing at some of that stuff because uh, that Dundee invoice story, oh, I'm looking forward to talking about that. Uh, and yeah, just quickly before we get into the pre-season of what Celtic were doing, just to do what was uh, what's happening in the um, you know, world culture heading into this season. So when the season did kick off, uh, number one in the singles chart was uh, Sean Mendes. Number one in the album chart was held by Ed Sheeran. It's either Ed Sheeran or Adele at this point in time, so it was Ed Sheeran's turn this time. And the number one movie at the box office and the season kicked off was uh, Disney's new version of The Lion King because they were in a kick at that point of doing live-action versions of all the classics. So it was The Lion King was number one there. And as for big news stories in 2019, even though it wasn't strictly from uh, when the season kicked off, the, there's a flu-like virus out in China that's causing a few problems in 2019. We might want to keep our eye on that. It could be significant. But anyway, let's talk about the actual Celtic season coming up in Scottish football and what was going on. One big headline, Liam. Neil Lennon is now permanently the Celtic manager. He got the job in the showers, allegedly, at Hamden. He mm -hmm. came in, obviously, when Brendan Rodgers, who, in some bizarre twist of fate, is now the Celtic manager again. What a funny old world we live in. Yeah, he obviously left in February 2019, and Neil Lennon, who'd been sacked by Hibs just a few weeks before happened to be unemployed, he stepped in to steady the ship. And, yeah, he ended up getting it full-time. We got the quite mental interview from Peter Lawwell on the sidelines at Hamden during the treble treble celebrations where he said things like we never even considered anybody else for the job we filed them all away in a filing cabinet any CVs that came in and for me personally my feeling at the time when Lennon did come in in February of that year to steady the ship I just thought for the love of God Celtic just surprise me here because I just felt like they're going to go for the cheap option the lazy option because it's this board, and uh, in the end they did, and I wasn't even surprised. I wasn't angry about it, and I know a lot of fans were angry, Liam. They, they were very, very angry, to put it lightly. Maybe even angrier than the reaction that Brendan Rodgers coming back got. It's kind of 50-50 with some. Uh, I was just sort of, ha just had apathy for it. It was just kind of like, well, I kind of thought this was going to happen. This is the way the club want to go. I guess I need to get behind it. But then, Liam, what about you when Neil Lennon was announced permanently as a Celtic manager in the summer of 2019? How were you feeling? Well, I felt like I was watching a really weird sitcom on HBO or something like that, where about a football team, like, 
you know, you look at stuff like Ted Lasso and all that and go, Christ, we've had weird, bizarre, more bizarre storylines than that. And this is one of them that fits right into it. The whole, just like everything about it. Okay, mm -hmm. it was unimaginative, it was non-creative. Mm -hmm. We sort of been there. Everybody thanked Neil. I don't know. I didn't know anybody that was really jumping up and down for it when it happened. Like by the time he started in September, I, you know, he'd, he'd got acceptance at that point. But see, just the stuff around about it. I, he said that we went into the shower and got him. I, and oh, I had a big pile, we had a bin full of resumes. Didn't even look at them, kept them in a drawer. It's like Michael Scott for the office type behavior. <laughs> How is this meant to be yeah. this, this credible man with his heated driveway and heat statues? And, you know, yeah. I don't know. It, it just seems bizarre, like somebody's gaslighting you. That's what it felt like, you know, because it just, I, I mean, the club acts like that. I, I wonder if, Connor, there is a filing cabinet somewhere at Celtic Park right now with all those CVs for 2019. I mean, I think they definitely must have spoke to people. There's no way. He has just been hyperbole from Peter Lawwell and the excitement of the moment, you know, that we'd won the treble treble at that point. I think he's just spouted it out without really thinking. So I was like, there's no way any football club of any stature would operate that way. Just like, no, because he's basically saying... Well, in February, we already decided that he was getting the job full-time. That's what he effectively said. But I do wonder, Connor, if there is like this filing cabinet somewhere, a box that's hidden away, do not open, and it's all these CVs from... Because was it not Rafa Benitez was like the favourite for so long? We kept hearing Rafa Benitez was named David Moyes. I think his name was linked, and most people turn their nose up at the idea of David Moyes, but look at what he's been doing now at West Ham. Who knows what could have been? But, um, yeah, you've got to imagine that he was just talking pish, basically, when he was saying that. It was just in the, the heat of the moment, essentially, Connor. I mean, the I think the thing is, is no one in this chat or on this show it would surprise any of us if it was <laughs> true. <laughs> uh, just to have this big, comically long filing cabinet that stretches from one end of the office to the other with just all these names in it and all these, you know, it's not exactly going to be Peter's little black book, although no. I think that's what they, they maybe eventually started using just to, you know, getting the usual candidates in for the position. But, yeah, it's, it was very strange, but you know what the Celtic board are like, they'll go for the mm. cheapest option. Uh, it's very much as if uh, Dermot Desmond's Mr Crabs and uh, Celtic is, is the crusty crab and he's, he's very... <laughs> avoiding and then spending money he's what he saved yeah. his pennies so yeah. they just kind of go for the cheaper option and, and that's the way that they look at it now my reaction to it at the time i was i was very i was like that was quick i was like i, I think he came in he did well yeah. you know to to get us over the line and mm. I, I think the it was very much for a i was we'll talk about it I, i'm assuming later on in the show mm was kind of riding on Rogers' coattails a wee bit. Mm -hmm. So, and he kind of took that, was on that crest of that wave, and that's how he got over the line. And then, as we've seen, it was a bit of a stuttery start and then had to change things up midway through the season. But, yeah, it was very strange. I was thinking, right, he's came in steady the ship, he can leave with dignity and we'll look at yep. some serious options to replace a manager of Brendan Rodgers' stature and then mm -hmm. they just gave him the job as soon as a couple of hours after we uh, won the treble in the Scottish Cup it was uh, to put a fucking pure dampener on me <laughs> and that, you, you should never have that feeling after winning winning a, a Scottish Cup and never mind doing it as part of a treble you know what right. I mean um, one of many trebles that we've won over the years um, but you know the Celtic board do what the Celtic board do and they, mm. they very much um, you know spit in the face of the support you know whilst mm. they asking them to fucking spend money <laughs> on their umpteenth in their umpteenth top in the strip of the season but you know it's it's no, it's no surprise to anybody that they do the things that they do, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I know people want to give them a bit of kudos recently for you know uh, with you know the and you know that I think they, 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 I think the, the 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 board are just very very lucky men. They just get good luck. <laughs> well, 
Yeah, it's mm. a term that's been used in recent times. But um, yeah, I've also just noticed we're calling a good choice of top tonight because that's the away top from uh, this season. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 this I one. picked this one on purpose. I yeah, it's on purpose. There's a very iconic game, obviously, with that shot. So obviously we'll be talking about that at some point. And topical as well because the opponents that night were also going to be playing in a few weeks' time in the Champions League. Will history repeat itself? But in terms of what Celtic did then, because we've got to crack on. Neil Lennon's the manager, I was quite a lot of apathy towards it, but it was just like, well, this is the way the club want to go. So be it. We just need to get on with it. And uh, one thing I suppose that would get fans on side is a, a big signing. You know, we talked about with the Brendan Rodgers reappointment a few weeks ago or a couple of months ago. You know, with a lot of the fans that were like not happy to see him back, a big signing would really, really help. Celtic pushed the boat out and spent £7 million on a single player that summer. And of course, it was Christopher Julian, who I mentioned at the top of the show as part of the, the trivia tonight. Uh, but yeah, £7 million we spent on from uh, FC Toulouse. We also brought in uh, Bolly Bolingoli, uh, Hatem, Ab- uh, Hatem Abd El Hamid. It's always a mouthful, that one. We brought in, and I'm going to say it quietly so that Liam doesn't get angry, we brought in Nick Taylor. We brought him in, yes. We also brought in Jeremy Frimpong, Lee O'Connor, remember him? And Luca Connell, very high hopes for Luca Connell. A lot of people thought he was going to be an absolute baller because he was a youngster at Bolton. And when Neil Lennon was obviously Bolton manager, most people thought, oh, he must have knew about this kid in the youth academy. He's going to be an absolute baller. And spoiler, and didn't really go anywhere with Luca Connell, sadly. Uh, but also coming in on loan deals, we brought in uh, Mohamed El Yunusi. He would have a significant contribution this season. Moritz Bauer, remember him. And Fraser Foster, he would definitely have a significant contribution in the what was played out of this season anyway, the three quarters of it. Uh, in terms of, and also there was another deal that happened that got cancelled, Liam. Do you remember which one it was? We signed another player. There was a video done with the Jerry McCulloch interview with the standard six or seven questions that you get. The the image got leaked to him and Neil Lennon in the boardroom and then it didn't happen. Do you remember which player it was? The Bull, Turnbull. It was, yes. So we put it back in here, David Turnbull. They discovered an issue with his medical I believe, and then he had to go and get an operation. He was in crutches for months after it. So, well spotted, the Celtic medical team. But yeah, we could have signed him a year before. But uh, yeah, he, was, he uh, stayed behind until the COVID season, the full COVID season started. But yeah, there is a video out there, Liam, that was recorded with uh, Jerry McCulloch asking the questions of uh, getting the usual seven or eight, whatever it is he gets asked. Uh, yeah, David Tumble sat alongside Neil Lennon. So that's probably filed alongside the pile of CVs that they never looked at as well that summer. That's probably hidden away in the archives somewhere in Celtic Park. But, uh, yeah, David Tumble, uh, would, I mean, him joining a year earlier would have helped with his development or would he still be in the exact same position he's in, Liam, do you reckon? don't know how much that injury took out of that. He's always so. like, yeah. look like a guy that enjoys playing football. He's always playing like, like, he looks like he's injured. He's always got a face on, you know. Like, you mm. know I don't like, like he might be struggling and pain or something, but uh, uh, injury might have took a lot more out of him than we expected. I think I think the player we originally signed in that season with Motherwell, I mean, I remember seeing him on highlight reels. He was banging him in and mm. leadership. And he looked, he looked, a, aye, he looked a prospect. I think we had every right to go for him at that point. I thought it showed good, uh, you know, just the board being a bit broad when it came to Scottish players and looking, so, okay, yeah. let's get one on the ascendancy. Unfortunately mm. for us and for him, bad luck. Got that Aye. horrible and took a year out of the boys' game, you know. So Although the Celtic board being the way they are, Liam, I, see when it got announced that it had been cancelled, I just went into full on, you know, fuck the board mode essentially on Twitter. And I was like, fuck it. Because at this point, we're linked with Julian, seven million quid. And I'm like, if we can't get a deal right for David Tumble, because I thought we'd messed it up. I thought it was us haggling again. I was getting John McGinn like feelings again. Like, have we fucked about again? I'm like, if we can't get that, how are we going to pay seven million for Christopher Julian? There's no way this board's going to do it. And in the end, a bit of egg on my face because yeah, he did have a legitimate injury, and uh, we did pay seven million for Christopher Julian. So what do I know? That's why I'm just a fan. I'm not in the board. I'm not the manager. That just shows. But I can remember at the time being absolutely furious because again, you're just a year after the John McGinn debacle, and you're just thinking, have we done this again? Have we haggled? I mean, Murrow will put a really strange statement about the deal being cancelled. It was just what did, really odd. It was just a strange, strange deal. And you're like, what's happened here? Who's to blame? What was going on? But yeah, he did actually have a legitimate injury and he was in crutches for months after it. Uh, but heading out of the club, there was a massive revolving door at Celtic this summer. I was surprised at how many left, but I wish Celtic had done this this summer when you look at you know, getting rid of dead wood, just cutting your losses. So in the summer of 2019, Scott Allen left, Dedrick Boyata left. 
Doris De Vries left. Marvin Compa was away. Emilio Izaguirre after one season back. He was gone. Christian Gamboa was away. Mikel Lustig left, which was obviously a sad one because we all like Mikel Lustig. Everybody loves Mikel. And the most crucial departure, obviously, Connor, was Kieran Tierney. 25 million, though. But um, yeah, we've, we were hoping we might see him return this summer, but obviously that was need to be. But were you surprised, gutted? How were you feeling about Kieran Tierney's departure, Connor? I think uh, that transfer window was kind of death by a thousand cuts for me. I mean, if you look back at it now, it's actually a really decent transfer window. You see who came in and mm. what we got for them and how they performed and stuff. But coupling with Rogers leaving, Kieran Tierney, who was one of my favourite players in that yeah. period, obviously, leaving and then replacing him with Greg Taylor, a player from Kilmarnock was like <laughs> like mind fuckery for me. I was like, Jesus Christ, what are we doing? Replacing, you know, arguably one of the best fullbacks in Britain with uh, Greg, Greg Taylor and he's away. And, you know, you, you get the I remember the <clears throat> the game, I can't remember, I can't remember which game it was, but I remember what he did when he came to and grabbed the, the megaphone for the mm-hmm. the supporters, the Green Brigade and was singing tunes and that. And there was a game where uh, was it Scottish Cup final? It got elbowed and had to go to the hospital. Yeah, it was the 2017. The Aberdeen player uh, elbowed him. Uh-huh. Yep, that's right. And then he came back and, and was like gone fucking tonto with it with the cup because mm-hmm. he ran back and he was running, ran back up the stairs to, to get his hands on the, the trophy. And all that stuff just endeared you to him. Do you know what I mean? He was, you know, a humble laddie who still stayed with his parents, lived, probably living in his, uh, his, his, his childhood bedroom with his. Uh, He's a Bobo Baldi bed sheets in his bed. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, uh, so, yeah, it's, and that's how you know he's a fucking fan. If your favourite player is Bobo Baldi, I mean, I don't think many people put Bobo up as their favourite player ever. So, you know, that's how he, he knew his shit. And, you know, he wasn't just telling porky pies. Like, a lot of players in that scene to come in, especially Scottish players, giving it all this shit about how they love Celtic and blah, blah, blah. But, um, I moving on, it was a, it was a shame... And I thought it was a bit of a weird move at the time because Arsenal have done absolutely fuck all in, in donkeys, man, since, you know, um, yeah. since Hingmeet, since um, Arsene Wenger left them. Mm. But we've got a really good fear. We're just like, I could see them, you know, really developing, you know. But bearing in mind, there was uh, people thinking he was going to be the next Celtic captain. Yeah, oh God, you, right? you had all the characteristics of it. Uh, it was a mm-hmm. high. He was a warrior on the pitch. He led mm-hmm. by example. He, he did take yeah. the, the armband for a, a, a game, a, a, for a cup game, and scored an absolute belter against, I think it was Kilmarnock. Um, <clears throat> so, I, it was a very, it was, it was quite sad for me. That that hurt more mm. than the Brendan one, because the Brendan one, I was more angry about it. The Kieran yeah. Turner one, kind of just, I was very much in there. Oh, he's not going to leave. He's not. How, how can he leave? He's a Celtic man through and through and all that stuff. And, you know when the when the the, mm. the the bag of coins are you know jang, jangled in front of your face, and mm. I don't think players are really going to say no anymore, no matter how much they love the club. But yep. yeah, it hurt, and you know it's we're still we're still trying to replace them to this day. Let's just hope that yeah, eventually we get it right. Yeah, fingers crossed. Is uh, because left back is still a, a problem, and of course that wasn't the only. Greg Taylor wasn't the only left back we signed, obviously. Bowling, bowling, golly! Uh, signed oh, that Jesus. season. He'll play his part in the ten in a row season and part of our demise. But we'll get to that when I do the next part of the COVID trilogy. That will be getting talked about. Trust me. Oh, what a shambles! Uh, but anyway, in terms of pre-season games, oh, first of all, as I always do at this point, I always need to keep an eye on the competition. So, what were our noisy neighbours across the city doing to try and stop us from winning nine in a row? Now that Brendan's gone, I think they thought oh, we've got a free run at it now. Neil Lennon, pff, he won't, he won't overcome Stephen Gerrard. So, what did they do? They brought in Philip Hollander, Joe Aribo. They brought back Stephen Davis. They brought Greg Stewart, Brandon Barker, George Edmondson, and Jordan Jones, who. The only thing I remember seeing him doing was getting sent off against us <laughs> when he'd done Moritz Bauer in the last minute and we're beating him 2-0. Oh, and they also made the lone move of Ryan Kent from the season before permanent. Again, I used him the question at the start because our £7 million centre-back outscored him this season, which is just hilarious to think about. So in terms of pre-season games, uh, we set up camp in Switzerland and Austria. We started off against a, an amateur team called uh, SC Pinkerfeld and beat them 6-1. Nice good run out for the boys there. And then uh, Weiner SC beat them 2-1 in Austria before heading to St. Gallen in Switzerland and drawing 0-0 and finishing with a 0-0 draw against Stad Red. So only four pre-season friendlies, but there's a reason for that because we had to play four 
qualifying rounds in the Champions League. So, yeah, it was that point in time when we're getting hammered with the old coefficient. So uh, we started out heading out to Sarajevo, uh, Bosnia, Sarajevo, beat them 3-1 out there, then beat them 2-1 at Celtic Park to move on. And then an absolute rare unicorn moment happened. We played a team from Estonia in the next round. I believe it's pronounced Norm Kalju. Beat them 7-0 over two legs. But Marian Schved not only got on the park, he actually scored a goal in the second leg. And I say an absolute unicorn of a moment um, to find in Celtic history. A Marian Schved appearance and goal. But sadly, nothing ever came of it after that. That was like his only fleeting moment in a Celtic shot. And yeah, he was back to, to obscurity after that. Uh, but then, of course, had it all come undone in the next round of qualifying against Romanian side Kluj, or Kludge, however it's pronounced. I don't know. CFR Kludge. Drawn 1-1 in Romania at a time when away goals were still a thing. So 1-1 draw out there, coming back to Celtic Park. So, of course, you're like, we'll beat this mob. You know, 1-1 draw out there, coming back to 60,000 fans. No, <laughs> it went completely wrong. I, I couldn't go more wrong if we tried. If I remember right, Liam, did Callum McGregor, I think, start at left-back, which seems to be a curse whenever Callum McGregor starts at left-back in a game, we tend to have a bad result. And he's played there a few times. So he was played there that night, just after we'd signed a left-back in volleyball and golly, and we'd signed a new centre-back in Christopher Julian, and neither of them featured. But we had a total implosion that night, losing 4-3. Uh, mad moments like Scott Bain, who was in goal, palming the ball right back out to a non-Russian striker for them to get a tap in. Scott Brown inexplicably swatting the ball away with his hand at a corner kick to give them a penalty. I think we led three times on the night. It was like 1-0, 1 each, 2-1, 2-2, 3-2. We end up losing 4-3 on the night and we are papped out of the Champions League for the second year running at the same stage as we were the season before. But don't worry, FC Kluge will be back in a very near future this season because they become the new Rosenberg because Rosenberg were a team that we kept playing. And then we beat them in a qualifier and then drew them again in the Europa League. So Kluge are about to take that uh, mantle from them. But we do drop into the Europa League uh, final playoff round and we beat uh, AIK Solna from Sweden 6-1 over two legs. We win 2-0 uh, at Celtic Park and 4-1 out in Sweden, and if you're a long-time championship manager player, a uh, football manager player, and Russell will appreciate this one, AIK Solna you will know because Stuart Baxter, championship manager legend uh, from the early 2000s, he's always like, was one of the high-rated managers and like champ manager 01 or something, and that's who he managed, Scottish manager, manager in Sweden, but it was AIK Solna was his team, but yeah, Celtic are now in the Europa League, so that wraps up the pre-season stuff, so yeah, now we will get into the main headline. So let's start with the European stuff. Let's continue it because get yeah, quite topical this one. Um, because we're going to be playing one of the teams that we played in this group in just a few weeks' time in the Champions League this time. But yeah, Celtic top the Europa League group. What a headline this is! Because uh Liam, the very idea of topping any European group right now for Celtic, even at Europa stage, it just seems such a far distant idea right now, doesn't it? Aye. <laughs> Can he <laughs> don't think it'll be happening this year, but I mean, <laughs> well, that was Neil proving. I think the same way Brendan has to do as well. There was a lot of expectations. A lot of people were underwhelmed with Lennon, and this was a great way for him to get the crowds back on side. At that point, I said, "Okay, maybe Lennon's changed and all that." But I mean, you could see indisciplines in the team and stuff like that just starting to crack. Like mm -hmm. there seemed to be like a there was a looseness to them that you could see them cough up goals. Don't remember ever like coughing up as many goals as we did. It was now acceptable to win games three one and four two and that, you know. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry, but um, I you know, European ways. Yeah, I, th I thought that was that was us starting to look really good, you know. Oh, I, I, we, uh, we, um, Neil Lennon definitely got it right in this group stage because yeah, we get drawn against Lazio from Serie A, Ren, who we played before in the Europa League and actually played in a pre-season friendly at the start of this season, so we're quite quite used to seeing Ren, we seem to be playing them quite a lot, whether it's a competitive game or a friendly and yeah, Kluge who knocked us out in the third round of the Champions League qualifiers, they get knocked out in the playoff round and we ended up drawing them in our group, so that was our four, but yeah, the first game we get a very credible point away to Stad Ren. Ryan Christie scored a penalty on the night. I think it may have been a VAR decision as well that got us the penalty, if I remember right, because VAR was still in the sort of early stages. But yeah, we do draw 1 1. But uh, Con, I'm going to test your brain here. Do you remember the mad last few minutes in this game where uh, Bio 
came on and was quickly off again because he got a red card. Do you remember the the man is because the Chelsea who became Chelsea goalkeeper is it Edward Mendy? He hammed it up a little bit to get old Bio sent off. But there's another one like Shved. What were we thinking with him, Bio? <laughs> I think uh, the less said about him, the better, oh. man. There's there's so many players over this period, uh, the, you know, the 2016 to like 2020, who just came in and they just did absolutely zilch in a Celtic <laughs> shirt and should yep. never be mentioned again. I think this is <laughs> Bio's only really <laughs> real contribution in a Celtic shirt. I think he maybe did score a goal actually in a game against Clyde, maybe in a Scottish Cup game. I think he did, yeah. But you know that's fucking that's like beating <laughs> your that's, that? like, that's like beating your fucking Sunday league team in the local park, man. Doesn't really matter. Right. But um, ah, it was a bit fucking scary, like because you know going away at a you know a, a tough venue against a team from League One to you know get a point and you're like Jesus Christ because you know what Celtics like it can uh, they can implode at any minute. So yeah. when decisions like that. Are made and look players can ham things up in that. It's just the modern game now. I, I, I think the the clever thing to do is to not give the referee a decision. Yeah, you know that's yeah, that's, that's, right. kind of, that's what you should fucking drill into players' heads now. Mm-hmm. But they don't seem to do it because you know if people like Ryan Kent and Todd can't let everything go by, they could literally poke them with your finger and they would like <laughs> roll over it. They've been fucking shot. Yep. So yeah. It's, I was very, I was quite nervous actually because I can't remember how much, how how much was left in the game, minutes wise, but I do remember just like praying to God that we would just see it out, take yeah. the, right. take the point and just go back back to Celtic Park where where I I do a deserved draw. I mean, right. so yeah, I just with that I was just like, well, let's just take this and <laughs> and run. <laughs> If I remember right, the, the timeline was it was with 86 minutes. He comes on as a late sub just to kill time. He gets booked within like a minute of being on, so he leads with his arm going up for a, a header. So he's on a booking right away. And then in stoppage time, somebody has a shot for outside the area and Mendy palms it back out and he chases it in, but he doesn't even make any contact with Mendy, but he swings his boot at it and Mendy just is like doing holding his face and the referee gives him a second booking and he was off. And I was like, oh, what, man? So uh, that was bio. One of his very few moments in a Celtic shot was getting sent off against Ren. But the bottom line was Celtic got off to a decent start. An away game against a French team and to get a 1-1 draw, it wasn't too bad at all. Funny enough, the last time we played Ren in the Europa League, we drew 1-1 out in France. That was when Chad Uvi scored a ridiculous own goal and then had a good wee chuckle about it, having Fraser Foster just like, huh, what are we like? You know, just laughing about it. It was that one in 2011. Uh, so yeah, we're repeating that score again with one each draw. But yeah, they head on to play Kludge at home um, and get a bit of revenge for what they did to us just a few weeks before. This time there is no mistake, there is no 4-3 crazy defending, nothing like that at all. We go and get the job done, beat them 2-0. One of the better games that the the ill-fated Bolly Ball and Golly had in a Celtic shot. He uh, was great going up that left-hand side that night, in particular setting up Hudson Edward for the first goal. Great cross to the near post, Edward scores a header. Second half, we hit them on a counter-attack, and it's just bucket and rain as well. It's like a great image of El Yunusi celebrating with the knee slide and stuff, but the rain's pelting down by he scores the second goal and gets a 2-0 victory. And you have four points after two games, but now comes the double header against Lazio. Uh, the big ones in the group, the big fish. And uh, yeah, they come to Celtic Park and they do take the lead in the game, which is something that gets forgotten about. In fact, they take the lead in both games, which again is something that might get forgotten about because of how both games ended. But yeah, Liam, then uh, we claw our way back into Celtic Park. You know, a win against a half-decent team at home in Europe. That's another thing that's became a bit a bit distant these days. But uh, yeah, Ryan Christie gets his back on level terms. But then, of course... 88 minutes, 89 minutes on the clock, we get a corner. Something that we don't do much. Ryan Christie pings it in, and Christopher Julian, and I was going to say he rises, but he doesn't need to do that much rising because he's like, what, six foot five or something? But yeah, he just gets a great header on it, nods it away, and absolute bedlam breaks out. Uh, a late winner. It gave me sort of like vibes of like beating Milan and Shakhtar years ago, you know, those last minute big European victories. The whole stadium's absolutely bouncing, but. Yeah, Christopher Julian, that's a way to endear yourself to the, the fans. That And that Superman celebration that he would do as well. But just absolute carnage in the stadium. And yeah, a win over uh, Lazio, which is uh, no mean feat really, isn't it, Liam? 
No, I think Lazio. I think Lazio were top, uh, top of the league at the time as well. They were they, no like struggling at all. It was a strong mm. Lazio team, and they looked good against us. And that was a good game. I thought Ella Nusi played great that game. There was a lot of our players really stepped up, and I think I think that was one of Neil Lennon's things where he could get guys geared up for a big game like that. You know, it's like at, at that time, you know, mm. like you know the Barcelonas and this, and you know, probably the same team talk. Here's a big club coming to your stadium. Let's get at them. You know, Christopher Julian. My God, I mean, is another thing. You know, Ange. I thought, wouldn't he look good in our back line right now, Phil? Christopher. I think with the centre back crisis right. we've got, I think he would do okay right now. <laughs> well, another one. I think we got rid of too quick because he didn't fit Ange's plans. And I know that, but it's like I trusted him at the time. But if I knew Ange was just, it was just a transitionary move for him to get like you did demanding a give guys like that a shot because everybody knows there's a player there because we've seen him. We've seen him in those games against uh, Lazio. I think he was a standout. And that, yeah. that whole first season, him coming into the team, it was like seven million. We're going, ah, shit, that's what you get for seven million. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's what you could see that right away. And everybody's going, I want the board to see this. You know, when you pay money, you get value. Mm-hmm. And that was apparent. And that's when you see it. You saw it in those European games. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is, Connor, do you remember as well in stoppage time while we're winning two one, we have a Lazio player at falls in the edge of the box, absolutely perfect volley. Fraser Foster, the great wall, he was like, "Nope, <laughs> you're not getting past me." But brilliant reaction save, and that again is why you go out and get these big because we knew what Foster could do. You know, we knew when and worked with him before, and we had Scott Bain basically as the number one keeper. Craig Gordon had, had been ousted essentially. Although I always thought Gordon was okay, I think he gets a bit of a hard time off a lot of Celtic fans. I think Craig Gordon was really good, but that save that Fraser Foster pulls off in stoppage time, because uh, yeah, it would have been a very Celtic moment, wouldn't it, Connor, in Europe for us to take the lead with a minute to go and somehow still not win the game. That would just be what I always feel is typical Celtic in Europe. But no, it was a, it was a hell of a save, wasn't it, man? Uh, uh, it was fucking, it was incredible. The, the shot was, a, to coin your term, it was an absolute thunder bastard. That was pilot pinged at him, at, like, and he smashed to save it. And uh, uh, I think that's what you get with, with Fraser Forster, man. He just, the, mm. you know, the, the man who was uh, given the nickname La Gran Marala, the Great Wall, by the, mm. the Spanish press, you know, after we beat Barcelona in 2012, under Lenny again. So, you know, I think, I know Lenny gets a lot of shit, but mm. he could fucking navigate a European tie. Don't let anybody tell you yeah. he couldn't. You know what I mean? Um, but, I but be Foster. I I I'm assume we'll talk about it later on tonight. But he mm-hmm. definitely proved he's worth this season, and that was just <laughs> one of the yes. many many examples. The thing with Foster was is like I'm not really confident um, with with keepers who are, are up against a good strike force, and mm-hmm. even if, 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 if fucking Hamilton could get a penalty against us if they mm-hmm. were in, in the league still, and I would I would I wouldn't you know trust a a keeper to save it because you know penalties are like ninety nine point nine percent in the 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 penalty takers' favour. Yeah. But with Fraser Foster, you always had that feeling that, that he could yeah, just totally. save whatever whatever was coming at him. You know, big big Fraser man. He's he's kind of the kind of guy I feel like uh, if you were having a shit time, he take you in take you in his arms and make you feel very safe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure he would. Yeah, oh, like, Fraser. Yeah, I'm only about five foot four, <laughs> mate. You could cradle me like a fucking child, man. These big <laughs> arms, man. But I, uh, it's a, uh, I loved, I loved Fraser Foster, man. He was a, uh, oh, he uh, this season he had there was a, a kit we had, and it was a, it was a goalkeeper kit, and it was black, and it, there was like a an aqua kind of green, mm-hmm. uh, yep. hoop, hoops on it. Um, sorry, Celtic badge, and that's the only goalkeeper kit I've ever bought for Celtic, and I'm like. Fucking Fraser Foster's rocking that, and uh, it was a nice keeper kit as well. So I bought it. You know I mean, and I was like, the only reason I'm doing that is because of Fraser Foster. You know, I think he's just so iconic. Yeah, as a goalkeeper for Celtic, I think it's between him and Arthur Boric are the two, you know, Celtic keepers that you think of for you know, yeah. um, uh, I- icon wise. Yeah, definitely um, a century I, I, for a shadow. Of doubt, I, they are the two best. I know, exactly. and I love Joe Hart, and he's obviously was one of the biggest players in the world, probably one of the best goalkeepers in the world at one point. I just think now 
you know, he's 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 not gonna he's still as good as he is and he is very, very good. I think I don't think he can kinda of hold a candle to the now to Froster or uh, Boric in their prime. But I um Froster man, we'll talk about him later, but my oh, god, I, that way. Oh, getting, I, you know, it's like we're getting the band back together, <laughs> who Fraser and Lenny coming back. So it was mm-hmm. it was it was on a, a a particularly good bit of business that season to to go along with many others. It was, it was. But yeah, we then head out to Rome. We not one on Italian soil. Uh, a Scot- Scottish teams had one on Italian soil, but Celtic weren't one of them. So this was a new territory for us going out there, hoping to get that elusive victory going to Rome, the Stadio Olimpico, the iconic Stadio Olimpico. And yeah, most people, again, because we're sort of conditioned to think that way, you know, home games of Celtic, you always have that hope, you know, and previous records have shown that we can be a force at home, but away games in Europe tends to be a bit of a bogey for Celtic. And uh, as I say, in Celtic doing Celtic things in Europe where they always manage to shoot themselves in the foot somehow. And yeah, we do fall behind quite early on in this game. Chiro and Mobley scores to give them the lead. But amazingly, Celtic turn that around. They plod away at them and then it's, uh, James Forrest gets his back on level terms. And Fraser Foster does his bit during this game to keep the score at one apiece. Uh, obviously with some of the amazing saves he was pulling out. But then, of course, Liam, it happens in stoppage time. Even later than the Christopher Julian goal, uh, we just pressed them from a goal kick. Lazio, I don't know if they're settling for the 1-1 draw. I don't know how they're feeling at that point. So Lazio ended up finishing third in this group. I didn't realise this until I looked it up tonight for my research. They didn't actually qualify from this group, so they needed a win, essentially. But yeah, we catch them cold when they pass out from the back. We just press them. Edward wins a ball from a, a loose pass. And uh, just times the ball perfectly for uh, Olivia and Cham. But Liam, were you a bit like me when it was happening in real time? Did you feel like the angle was always getting away from Cham? Because he lets it roll across him and it's getting small. As well. and Ch- I mean, Cham's obviously not a striker and he doesn't score that many goals from midfield. And you're like, oh, you don't know what's going to happen, but he, he dinks it absolutely perfectly over Strakosha as he dives at his feet. And of course, Chris Sutton's reaction on the commentary, everything about it, the the, the celebration, we're doing the cartwheel, just absolute bedlam, wearing that kit that obviously Connor's got on, the iconic now yellow one, because again, you associate the kit with the image of the goal and stuff like that as well. You know, these are now burned into your memory forever. But yeah, at the time though, as it was happening, I was like, oh no, he's going to miss it here because he's let it run for too long, but no. Cool as you like, Liam, and he just dinks it over him and what a moment it was. I it was like I, I couldn't believe that when and it was one of the goals that you see in highlights so and it's like oh Christ that's us you know brilliant absolutely the way he took it the way he put it through I mean I thought he'd let it go as well but the confidence to hit it like that that's yeah. what I thought he was going to take a touch but uh yeah. I, back in first time but see when you're saying the build up to that goal Elia yeah. Nussi was absolutely brilliant on the left there that mm-hmm. ball came and I remember him he sort of moved him out the way with his arse, like one of the old Scott McDonald type moves. <laughs> yes. big, or Chris Chris Commons would move, move you out the way. And he sort of did that and managed to twist around the defender and get the ball to Eddie. And uh, uh, what, what a goal. I mean, the fact that Nancham thought about doing a Mussolini headstand at that, at that point, just yes. to get, which was which claimed after that it was some sort of insult to, like, Get, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, uh, but I, good. I, and I was thought, all oh, right, that's us turned a corner away in Cham. We're always waiting for him to. Yeah, of course. Game. And I'm thinking, okay, that's the, that's the, that's the player in Manchester City, but that's the one, you know, mm-hmm. young, you know, 20, under 21, you know, it's nice. a good player, you know, and I thought his career would have kicked on. Bo- mm-hmm. Both of him and Julian, I thought that was the French connection was starting to form and we were starting yeah. to get a identity under Neil Lennon and you know oh was, we we're just gonna tear the tear the place apart now you know I I also I remember the quite surreal time as well on Twitter at that point where Celtic fans are basically tagging Mussolini's granddaughter and Aye. slagging her off and calling her I don't want to repeat what they were calling her we may get cancelled for it but I see that'll flare up again in a couple of already seen some Celtic fans Do you remember already. the banner do you remember the yes, banner? Yes, was, I remember the banner. Yes, follow your follow, leader. Follow, follow your leader and that. And yes, you're like, I remember. Man, <laughs> did, did they get in trouble for UEFA with that? 
I, I think you got in trouble for the one at Celtic Park where it was um I can't remember the Italian word for it. We basically said go fuck yourself, Lazio in Italian Aye. was what it said. Uh but yeah, it's like yeah, the UEFA don't particularly like it when there's a, a very expletive a big expletive on a, a banner essentially they'll step in, but UEFA in politics and banners and that we could argue about that all night because they've shown a lot of hypocrisy on that one over the years. But yeah, we did we did cop another uh, slap on the wrist from UEFA for that one, but I'm sure in a few weeks, I've already seen some Celtic fans already tweeting at Mussolini's granddaughter to a reminder of 2019. So, uh, yeah, will history repeat itself? But yeah, Celtic have now uh, undefeated after four games. And amazingly, after that result, we'd actually now qualified from the group. We hadn't won the group outright yet, but we're now officially through to the next round after just four games, back-to-back wins uh, against Lazio and beating Kluge and drawing with Ren. Yeah, we're through at this point with uh, 10 points on the board. How good would it be to have 10 points in this group we've got coming up this year? But after four games, we're on 10 points. And then we play uh, Wren in the fifth game. This seals us as the group winners. We beat them 3-1. And uh, the goal scorers that night, Lewis Morgan, um, Mikey Johnston and Ryan Christie all scored that night. Yeah, Lewis Morgan, this is just before that cup final where Lewis Morgan's getting tried out as a striker. And he played this night and he scored. And then Mikey Johnson comes off the bench and scores. And Ryan Christie scores one as well. So yeah, we end up beating them 3 1. And when we go into the final game against Kluge, uh, we were actually through at this point as group winners and we lose 2 0. So we lose a 100% record. But yeah, we were already through. And yeah, we're heading into the Christmas period at that point. Very busy time for fixtures. So I think if I remember right, we fielded a sort of second sort of string team that night. And uh, yeah, we were through. So no worries there. But of course, then Celtic do Celtic things in Europe. And after Christmas, the cost of. Uh, our knockout round football strikes again. We are, yeah, we uh, play FC Copenhagen. We have a brilliant first half out in Denmark. We play them off the park for one dollar at half time. Everything is rosy. We're looking like, oh, we're going to cruise past this team. They borrow it. We got a great draw. We're already thinking about the next round. Maybe some fans are even thinking about the final. But yeah, in the second half, we have a complete capitulation in terms of we just seem so nervous. And we end up drawing 1 1. But ultimately, away goals are a thing at that point. It's a 1 1 draw. And again, much like the Kluge game in the qualifiers, we're coming back to Celtic Park where a 1-1 draw and away goal. What could possibly go wrong? Well, Celtic do Celtic things in Europe. And once again, everything goes wrong. We look nervy on the night. We're just not taking our chances. They take the lead. And late on in the game, we get a VAR decision. So again, I say VAR's only just came in. We got a penalty from a corner where the ball comes in, player handballs it. Referee lets the play go on for another 30 seconds or so. And then he stops it and he's like, He's got to go and review it on the screen. We get a penalty. Austin Edward, I think, scores a Penenka, if I remember right. He Penenka that. Mm-hmm. And you see the, the, the image in the replay where he tells the players as he runs to get the ball, he tells them to concentrate. He's pointing to his head going, concentrate because there's five minutes to go on the clock. Okay, we've not played great on the night, but we've got an equaliser. It's head to extra time. Let's just regroup. We'll beat them in extra time. But for whatever reason, the rest of the team just feel compelled to just go for it, just go gung-ho. And we get caught out twice on the counter attack with minutes to go and end up losing 3 1. And it's like oh, typical. So, yeah, I think out of all the ones, Liam, we talk about Celtic sort of hoodoo in Europe after Christmas. The Copenhagen one, I think, is the biggest what could have been moments. I know Bodo Glint, people can talk about as well, but I think that Copenhagen one, that is the one that got away. We should have broke that duct there, shouldn't we? I, I mean, that was the team. We, we, we should have hammered them. And you're right, it was. That, but we didn't do that. We went the other way. You know, by the way, I don't know if anybody was at the Cluj games. You ever been to Cluj? I've only ever seen it in videos and all that. It looks like an amazing city. And Is that, that the one that's near Transylvania? Aye, that's what that would have been part of the capital of Transylvania. Speaking of that, just quickly, do you see, do you, I don't know if you remember him, right? But there was a player that played in that Cluj team. He looked like a vampire. <laughs> like he looked like a vampire. I was like, have they got fucking Dracula playing for? Because he had like, he had like sharp teeth. He uh-huh. had pointy ears and he had like a big nose. And I was like, have they got fucking Dracula playing for the best team coming through the media? <laughs> I just find it quite humorous. Did they have a collar up like Cantona? I <laughs> <laughs> had a cake oh. one, no? I, I don't remember him specifically. I remember us being linked to one of their strikers. There's a French guy up front. It was one of the ones after he played against us. We were getting linked to him for the next few transfer windows, but there was never any movement on it at all. But um, yeah, it's the Celtic <laughs> once again in Europe after Christmas. We hope if we do find ourselves in Europe after Christmas, this coming season, we can actually go through a few rounds at least. Because yeah, for me, I say the Copenhagen one is the one that just got away. I felt like we, we were more than good enough to beat them over the two legs. But 
sadly it wasn't to be and yeah a European campaign was over so it was all about domestic football so yeah to say other than obviously a European season we've got to obviously do this silence the noisy neighbours and again going back to what I said at the top there Neil Lennon he's got the job not many fans were too happy about it some were showing a bit of apathy was it some were angry but ultimately if he's going to keep fans on side obviously if you can keep the noisy neighbours quiet then that's going to go a long way and yeah this season was an interesting one because uh, we played them quite early again and tell me guys if this story sounds familiar if you've heard this one before maybe recently we're going into the first uh, game, the first Glasgow derby against them. It's at Ibrooks. It's only like the fourth fixture of the season. And all the talk from the media going into it is all about Rangers this, Rangers that, and what they're going to do. And in the end, it didn't quite go that way. Celtic turned up and spoiled the party. Yeah, Connor, does that sound familiar at all? Have you read that one before somewhere? Aye, I feel like it's, uh, I'm getting this deja vu feeling. I feel like I've seen this movie before. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's not that it's funny that it's not like the media to always, you know, peg Rangers to, you know, give us a doing or give us a spanking and then we turn up and fucking beat them in their own back garden. So, yep. yeah, yeah, I do. I remember it quite well. <laughs> so this is the game that Odson Edwards scored. Mikey Johnston played that day and this was um not too old, a few months after he played the last time at Ibrooks as a striker. But he sort of exercised the demons because if you remember right as well, Mickey Johnson actually started that season really, really well under Neil Lennon. He's brilliant. And the ironic thing is, he started the season as a pure vital player for us, playing probably the best football he's played. And amazingly, his season actually ended with this moment. That's how his season ended, because he went off injured against St. Johnston with a few games to go, what well, turned out to be a few games to go. And that was how his season ended, with an injury and getting told, fuck off, by Neil Lennon. But he was brilliant in this game. Uh, Connor Golson tries to pass it to defence, plays it right to Johnson, who picks a perfect pass into Odson Edwards. And yeah, once he's through on goal and he's got all that time to pick his spot, there was nothing to stop it. There's obviously a great still image from that one as Edwards slotting the ball past McGregor. And you see all the Rangers fans in the Copeland Road end behind the goal, all with the exact That's same wild. pose. Like, because they know, they know that they're in danger when he's through on goal, you're not stopping. He runs by the Copeland Road then telling them sit down, you know, just you sit down, you should calm it boys, uh, but yeah, gives us a 1-0 lead, and of course in the bold, Johnny Hayes makes it 2-0 as the game is uh, petering out, because yeah, Rangers just, again, just like the game the other week they ran out of ideas, they were struggling to break us down, we were just dealing with them, they were throwing balls into the box and Christopher Julian and Neil Beaton, who started at centre-back that day uh, were having a good game, dealing with everything uh, Ball and Golly had a good game at left-back El Hamid was brilliant at right-back we just dealt with everything and yeah, Johnny Hayes ends up scoring the goal at the end. But on terms of Neil Lennon, I say when, I, when he was appointed, uh, one thing you know when you can always say about Neil Lennon, he's a fan, he's one of us essentially. If you put just a Celtic fan off the street and charge a Celtic, the way he reacts to the club and the way he's the way he talks about the club, it's like well, you can tell he's just a fan. So after the game, he didn't miss when it came to his post-match press conference. I've never done this for him, nostalgia. This is the first I've actually got the audio clip of Neil Lennon's post-match press conference where he goes into the media room with like Sky and all the different TV companies and newspapers sitting there. And remember that Rangers fan last week when we beat them that was basically going, fuck you and fuck you and fuck you as well? This is Neil Lennon basically walking into that room and just basically saying, oh, they John Lossi, fuck you and fuck you as well. I'd see you, fuck you especially. So I'm going to play the audio clip just now. And again, from my point of view, because at that stage, I'm still like, oh, you know, Lennon, that is what it is. See, so as soon as I heard them say this, I was like, yes, yes, Neil Lennon. That is the Neil Lennon that I want as manager. This is the guy. I'm all in. I'm on the Lenny bus right now. So yeah, here is Neil Lennon's words to the media after the game. In this fixture, I was an afterthought. My board were an afterthought. It was all about the opposition and what they were going to do to us. And we didn't listen to any of you. We stayed strong. We played brilliantly. Even in your promo for the game, Charles, there's no picking. It's really nice of you. I feel like Brooks Kupka here. So we came here to win. We came here to be strong. First half, we lost at Brown. Outstanding. He's another one's been written off, by the way. Ball and goalie, Julian. Outstanding performances. And I've got a front four who are a handful for any team. I thought we deserved to win the game by more. I think the second goal was icing on the kick. I think we defended strongly when we needed to. El Hatem, a, a great performance, you know, coming in from the cold. But the personality and the character and the strength of the team was evident today when everyone, including some of our own supporters, had written us all off. So we are very, we're proud. We take the three points. Psychologically, it's a nice win for us, and we move on. You know, you take. There you go. 
Brilliant. I wasn't even in your opening feature to Charles Patterson for Sky Sports. That was nice of you, wasn't it? <laughs> Brilliant, <laughs> William. I, I, I liked it. it was calling some out by names as well. But I, that's the Neil Lennon we love, that wee bit of swagger, you know, just yeah. to get, get in amongst it and that. And I, and the, the press were like, they, they do it all the time. And it's, I think they have to. They have to sell papers to that mob as well. And mm. so they can't just keep hearing about how great we are. And so... They have to make something so there's nothing real so they can only talk about hopes and dreams and what they're going to do and what they might do and whereas if you just keep quoting about us it's all what we've done and our facts and what we've achieved they've achieved nothing so they can only dream aye aye it was um so it's a great great moment just going and see so it's like a fan it's like if i was the manager and i was walking in i would just be i'd just be living it up you know just like i get it up yes everyone you know you gave us no prayer at all and there you go we stuck it to you but um yeah, it's the type of thing that would get fans like me who were kind of not sold on it. Got me on side, and I'm like, yeah, now I'm now I'm on board. Come on, Neil Lennon, this is what I want to see. And yeah, of course, the next time we play them, Connor, as you know fine well, would be the League Cup final in uh, December. And safe to say, we rode our luck just a little bit that day. It's one of those games that if you were watching it from home, you'll probably hide and find the couch watching it because. I don't know, we just seem to conspire that day to just try and lose that game at all costs, and we just they just couldn't put, put the ball past us. I was actually in the stadium, I'd swear to God, I felt like I looked at the clock a couple of times and it had gone back the way. I'm like, I'm sure that said 65 minutes a few minutes ago, and it was like 60 minutes, and I'm like, what? Time's going back the way, this is like the longest game imaginable, we were just under the course from pretty much the first minute. But my God, out of all the cup finals, because that was the 10th trophy that we'd won in a row in terms of not league titles, that's something we'll talk about in the next episode, that ill-fated one. But actual just silverware, that was the 10th one we picked up in a row. And at full time, it was probably the most satisfying one because we totally shithoused it and I loved it. I just absolutely loved everybody. Forget all the good football when we played under Brendan Rogers in the treble treble or the, the invincible treble year. I was like, do you know what? We just got a, we just rolled our sleeves up and just won it the ugly way there and get it up every single one of them. I I think everything in that that game just happened so perfectly. Fraser Foster, like I, there's only you know you're under the cosh when your your best player on the pitch is a goalkeeper. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think we can. Uh, you know, we started. Uh, the thing was Edward was injured. We didn't mm-hmm. know whether they would start. He's then found out he's on the bench, and we play Lewis Morgan up front against yeah, Rangers, who was essentially a man down. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I just I remember a, I think I swear to God it was maybe like a minute in or something. Ryan Jack lets it a fucking absolute mental shot, and yeah. it's flying right for Foster, and then he he he, he, he palms it out, and he saves it, and it's just the performance he put on that day. I think is legendary, man. Mm. Especially against them, it was fucking amazing. The icing on the cake of that fucking Fanny Morelos getting given <laughs> the penalty by Tavernier. Because bear in mind, I think this was in a bit when Tavernier had missed a, a couple of these last penalties. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it, I mean, it doesn't really make a difference considering he gets about fifty a season anyway and scores it before eight of them. But <laughs> um, it's I think he'd missed a, a last uh, the last two as well. And it just shows you he's got any fucking bollocks as a captain. Given Agreed. you know, Agreed. given it, you know, yeah, you, you just your big moment against your rivals to get a penalty to go one nil up, or to, was it to go? Was it one one? Would have made one each. We go one nil up about five. Aye, sorry, one each. Some get sent off as a aye, result of the penalty. Aye, I mind, I mind that. Um, what a player he was for us, but uh, oh. aye, um, and it just gives it to Morelos. She's also just going to oh, uh, silence the. Fenian bastards break your duck against them and, mm. and score. I remember Morello stepping up to and he fake chewing them. He was pretending right, so he was, was, was pretending to chew gum. You're like, why are you doing that? I, I mean, look, he, he maybe had a fucking pepper ham in his back pocket and was chewing on that. The fucking fat bastard, but <laughs> I don't know what it was. But he then goes and I remember the commentary as well, man. If he hits and it's one of the worst penalties I've seen taken in this fixture. And Foster uh, saves it, palms it out, and then obviously we clear the ball. And it, I think it was was it Rory Halton was like, "Oh, Fred and else." He goes, "Still can't score <laughs> against Celtic." Yep. Now, obviously, we would come to do that in the next again season, but that's for another day. Mm-hmm. And obviously, we then in that game, uh, 
we get a um, we make a substitution. We bring Odson Edward on, mm -hmm. and you can tell in the back of their mind they're like, right, he's their talisman. Mm -hmm. He's very much going to try and make this a game. He's just come back for he's he's a bit um, weak and he's he's slightly injured. Mm -hmm. You know for a fact that that Diddy Gerard and Beal have like went oh go and show him he's in a game. Yes, so Connor Goldson does his usual comes in and absolutely clears him out. Mm -hmm. We get a free kick from the resulting free kick. Christopher Score. Julian scores, and yep. I remember, I remember it. It was the, it was the best. It was the coolest knee slide I've ever seen a player yes. do in my life. Brilliant. And you know he runs up and he does the the Superman um, celebration, mm -hmm. which by the way was so iconic that they put it in FIFA. It was in FIFA, in that's FIFA. right. It is in FIFA. Yep. Uh huh. So it was even other players would do it. Like if you were playing with fucking Ronaldo, he would do that celebration as well. It was mm -hmm. a celebration for for yeah. players. Um. So yeah, and just if people will argue whether it was offside or not. And I remember that it was a discourse. You know, you know, obviously it's always going to be some sort of. Yeah. Always cheated, never defeated. That's yeah. the Rangers philosophy. Um, but no, there was something sweet and ironic about it that it came from the free kick that they gave mm -hmm. away in an attempt to show the odds of Edward, oh, you're in a yeah. game now. We scored off that. Yeah. And of course, Mikey Johnston could have made it too. And I've always pointed to this moment. I feel like this is the moment Mikey Johnston's career just skewed off. Well, I think if he scores this and he's got that on his CV, effectively a winning goal in a cup final against Rangers, I think a lot of fans view Mikey Johnston in a different light and maybe his career really kicks on after this. But no, he's full on goal and I can never be in the stadium. I'm grabbing my mate. I'm not even looking at my mate. I'm grabbing him though, like celebrating, like shaking him because I'm like, he's going to score. He's right through on goal. We've caught them on the counter-attack. Well down to 10 men. And yeah, he slips at the last second, but the rain was ridiculous that day. It was soaked at Hamden. And yeah, he slips at the last second, puts it by the post. That just adds to the agony because there's still about 15 minutes left on the clock at that point. You're like, oh my God, are we going to get through this? But we did. And one of the things that I love about the celebrations is there was no handshakes. There was none of that. Oh, good game, guys. Well played and all that. Unlucky. No, the Celtic players just gave it wild at full time. Ran right to the Celtic fans, led by Scott Brown. Fraser Foster running out his goal, doing a big knee slide or was it not like an arse slide? Essentially slid on his arse, didn't he? <laughs> and um, yeah, and then you see like the Rangers players are absolutely broken. They're like, even on their worst day, we still couldn't beat them. Ryan Jack crying on Steven Gerrard's shoulder. It was just, oh, it was beautiful. It was just so fucking good. Just shithoused it. We, no shame in it at all. We did what we had to do. We got the win. First trophy of the season. And it's like, great. See, even on our worst day, you still couldn't beat us. But the warning signs were there. Bit of naivety from us, maybe, because we played them in the league just a few weeks later at Celtic Park. And incredibly, they came to Celtic Park and they beat us. We were just, again, dreadful that day. We ended up losing 2-1. Ryan Kent scores. He does the gun celebration as he runs by the Jockstein lower end where I sit. I'm glad that I survived that drive-by, though, so I could watch the bottle job that they did in the second half of the season. So that was always something. But Katic scores a winner for them. I think the game was summed up how bad it was for us. We a few minutes to go. We got a free kick outside the area, out wide. Instead of Lee Griffiths trying to ping it into the area to try and get it on somebody's head, he shoots from out wide and blazes it over the bar. We end up losing 2-1. Steven Gerrard absolutely hams up the celebrations. Their commentator, it's an audio sound, but he's like, we're back and we're back with a bang. Well, when they come back for the January break, they're certainly going to be a bang because uh, their season's about to go bang as it turns out. Because, yeah, we need a tactical turnaround. Rangers have clearly sussed us after how we rode our luck in the cup final and they beat us at Celtic Park. So we head into the January break. We have a wee trip to Dubai. Oh boy, that's something we're going to talk about in the next episode. But yeah, we do go to Dubai. We come back and yeah, the two seasons go in completely opposite directions because going into the January break, they had the momentum. They were the favourites all of a sudden, Liam. But then Neil Lennon, who again is seen as a dinosaur in football, you know, doesn't know anything tactically. He switches up. He realises that Whatever we're doing is no working, right? We've got to change it up. And something, Liam, that we always shout about in domestic football when it comes to Celtic, try two up front, try two strikers. So he tries 3-5-2 when we come back for the January break. And we go on an amazing undefeated run while their season goes in the complete opposite direction. But Lee Griffiths and Odson Edward together were tearing it up, mate. Do you remember just how good these two were, Liam? They were reading off each other like, like Stokes and... Um, uh, uh, what do you call him? Uh, Hooper. No, uh, Hooper, Stokes and Hooper. Like, it reminds me of that sort of chemistry. No quite Sutton and, and, and Larson yet, but my God, for what we had and then what we showed, it was starting to bring out the best qualities in, in both players. 
I like us when we play in Scotland with three at the back. I hope Brendan's got this planned. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that's why Skills is on the team. And maybe we'll not be doing it in the Champions League, but I hope when, when we see them on was it Saturday or Sunday I mean, this weekend, I, I'd like to see Celtic start with three at the back and make it strong. And see what that, that you know, see what we can do that again with two strikers up front. I think we've got the players, and I think you can, you know, you you can see a Kyogo being more like a Griffiths player, you know, nippy catching rebounds, all that sort of stuff. And then you know maybe it owes owes that more of an Eddie, you know, a bit mm -hmm. more or you know a bit more power. I know I'd, I'd like to see that, but yeah, that, that, that was a good tactical change with Neil Lennon, and I yeah. thought it, the crowd were all crying for it. You know, it was all the message boards and yeah. asked everybody, he's like, come on, we should be doing this, and then. That was good, yeah. Then he does it, and it, and it paid off. And, and at that point, aye, we were unstoppable. And how good a bet was going to Dubai? It was like, oh, we're carrying on that Rogers tradition. Now that's good because that yeah. gets a result. And so we were thinking, all right, this we break and beep tests, and you know, mm -hmm. like a club into the twenty first century with proper training camps during close season and all that. Mm -hmm. But oh yeah, it was such a rousing success. We'll do it again next year uh, with a. Uh different results to say the least uh but yeah it's, it's, the way the momentum shift happened it was ridiculous because rangers go from being effectively the title favorites on january the first to by the time we get to early march they are 13 points behind us uh rangers would lose to hearts in the league they'd lose to kilmarnock and infamously would get beat by hamilton academical at ibrooks which was Another great Neil Lennon gift where we drew with Livingston in the same night and somebody tells Neil Lennon about the result and he looks at it with John Kenny and goes, Hamilton? You can tell he's <laughs> like, Hamilton? What? Because they've always told him, by the way, Hamilton have just won at um, Ibrooks. They also get knocked out of the Scottish Cup by Hearts, who are bottom of the league as well, and they drew with Aberdeen and St. Johnston. So yeah, they've completely mm. fell apart. Meanwhile, Celtic go on an eight-game unbeaten run. Eight wins and a bounce. Then we drew with Livingston, but then we played the next league game and won 5 0 against St. Mirren. So yeah, in a 10-game spell from the January break, uh, we won nine and drew one. Well, they went in the completely opposite direction. So yeah, March the fourth, um, well, March the 7th, sorry, was the last time that we would play football that season. Cause uh, yeah, it was all leading towards the Glasgow Derby on the 15th of March. 2020, and they say Rangers at this point they have completely capitulated. Stephen Gerrard, they're calling for his head. Think about the reaction Michael Beal got last week at Ibrooks. They were screaming for Stephen Gerrard to get the sack, and of course, by de facto, that would mean Michael Beal would get the sack as well. Then, uh, because yeah, it was going to, it was we're, we're going to go to Ibrooks, we're going to beat them, we're going to do what we did at the start of the season, but this time we're going to really do them because we mm -hmm. have all the momentum, we're playing so well right now. Uh, and yeah, it was going to be on the 15th of March 2020, but then of course everything stopped because coronavirus ruins everything, that little virus I was talking about in China at the end of 2019 keep an eye on it, yes it came along and it did ruin everything, because yeah just prior to the weekend of us playing them, um, Nicola Sturgeon called a halt to all sport in Scotland until we figured out what the hell was going on now Rangers had actually played a Europa League game on the Thursday night against Bayer Leverkusen, Liverpool down in England. They played a Champions League game against Atletico Madrid at Anfield um, through the week as well. But yeah, sport was kind of slowly grinding to a halt as people, the UK sort of began to realise we may have a problem here. Obviously, there was the famous or infamous now interview with Boris Johnson on this morning talking about that it's best to just let the let it just go through the, the population, you know, just let it sweep through and, you know, we'll gain a natural immunity to it, all these types of things, all these quotes, because, uh, again, it was maybe just the sort of ignorance of the British government, or the Tories, after all, and ignorant, of course, that goes hand in hand, where they just kind of thought, we don't need to worry about it. It's just a flu, we don't need to worry about this at all, but, yeah, things were starting to slowly grind to a halt. Other countries around Europe were starting to, you know, go into lockdowns. Italy had it really, really bad. But yeah, the Cheltenham Festival still went ahead the weekend that we were meant to play Rangers. While football seemed to get put on the back burner, they still allowed the Cheltenham Festival to go ahead. Yep. 200,000 fans over like four days at Cheltenham. Mental. But then on the 23rd of March, they finally threw the towel in and everything stopped, Connor. It was just surreal. It was like we got the Boris Johnson on the TV saying it was a lockdown and definitely what did this mean? How many weeks was it going to be? People were saying three weeks, three, whatever, you know, what will it be? But my God, we were not ready for what was coming, were we, Connor? No, I, the thing I remember about that is obviously we were due to play them and 
I was. I, this was the the derby. I, I've been. That was the most uh, excited I'd been. Yeah. For a derby in a long time, uh, because I knew for a fact we were going to give them an absolute drubbing, because mm-hmm. obviously they just been beat off Hamilton at fucking Ibrox, <laughs> and I don't know if you remember this right, but hey, uh, in there I got leaked to in their pre-match program. That night, mm-hmm. Tavernier did an interview. He did. And essentially spilled the beans on saying that they were weak mentally as a team and they didn't like being under pressure. And that also that night, on I think the, the 7th or 17th minute, they were to do a round of applause for Steven Gerrard for yes. five minutes or something. And they then get beat off Hamilton and are booing at the game, <laughs> wanting them sacked. It was, you know, yes. a calamity of... of there's massive proportions and I remember we were to play them on the Sunday mm-hmm. on the Wednesday Nicola Sturgeon the Scottish government said on Monday, so the, the day after the, mm-hmm. the derby all football and sporting events will be stopped mm-hmm. and I was like phew, the yeah. game will still go ahead mm-hmm will be the last game this season, we'll pump them and they will have to sit and stew on that because mm-hmm. we'll have fucking pumped them to the league and they'll have to sit on that for, for however long until football comes back. Mm-hmm. And on the Friday afternoon, I remember I was sitting on the couch doing what you do, you know, just chilling, mm-hmm. preparing mm-hmm. for the game, looking at highlights, mm-hmm. whatever. Nicholas Sturgeon comes on the telly, makes an announcement that all sporting events shall be cancelled. Mm-hmm. And I was so angry. I was yes. like, you said you're going to cancel it on the Monday. What mm. difference is a couple of days going to make? Literally zero. Mm. But once again, as we see, football fans, and especially football fans in the UK, are the first ones to be punished. We're the first ones to be yeah. have our things took away from us, and we're the first ones to suffer for it. You know, the mm. fucking the, rug, the rugby fans, or fucking cricket fans, or hundreds well, of thousands. The Cheltenham of people, Festival went ahead um, that weekend. Hundreds the of thousands. Exactly, mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands of people at a bloody horse racing event mm-hmm. where they're all they're all uh, cooped in together. Yep. That was totally fine to go ahead, but no football where it's in an open area of space. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there's not as many people there. No, that can't go ahead. No, he's not allowed. No, again, uh, it's just it's yep. and it's the attitude. I know people will say, oh, it's because of coronavirus, deadly virus, what protect people, blah blah blah. But it's the same old story. As football fans are constantly punished because we are hated by our own government. They think we're scum and they hate Mm -hmm. us. And that's why I do not like our government, Tory government. They're all fucking snakes, in my opinion. And I I hate them. I hate them with passion. So, yeah, I do remember it very well. And obviously, I'm sure we'll get to it. But uh, Mm. do you remember when uh, football started coming back eventually? Mm -hmm. And the first game on the telly was a Bundesliga game. And everybody, their, Dortmund and Schalke. Mm-hmm. everybody in their granny was wa- watching Dortmund. I was watching Schalke. it. I, 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 I was watching it as well because they were like, we've not had football in so long. We everybody on Allen scored and they had to do a socially distanced celebration and the Dortmund players were clearly not taking it seriously. They're doing like a wee dance, but they're all standing five feet away from each other. Mm-hmm. But then they're standing at corners, like tight marking each other. Yeah. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. They're supposed to socially distance. How can you do that in like set pieces? So it was just bad, but yeah, I think that Dortmund Schalke game was one of the most watched games in televised football history because the whole uh-huh. world was just choking for a game of football. But yeah, that empty stadium, that was uh, it was weird to just sit and watch that. It was like this is a taste of things to come, sadly. Uh, but yeah, I see the, the the football stopped in Scotland indefinitely. But after three months, I see some big leagues and competitions decide to come back and play it out to a finish. Other leagues decided, no, we're just going to call it, we're going to put it to a vote or whatever happens. So we were one of the leagues that opted for the vote. Like the Premier League, the Bundesliga, the big UEFA competitions, the Champions League, Europa League, they all got played to a finish over the summer as it became an elongated season. But yeah, as for Scotland, Liam, it was a case of, um, no, we will... We'll just put it to a vote. There was always talk that Ibrox apparently they ripped up their pitch anyway, so it would have been impossible for them to play on because, yeah, they that's a story that seems to always get you know, they stick their fingers in their ears and go, Not listening to me, not listening to that one at all. And it's like, No, he's dead, he's, he's basically ripped up your park after he's realized this isn't getting restarted, so it would have been hard for you to restart any games, you couldn't play any at home. Uh, but yeah, it obviously went to a vote. 
And uh, yeah, it got a bit interesting. In the end, Celtic were awarded the title. We were 13 points in front. And regardless of what they may think about, oh, we would have caught you and all that. Well, no, nah, there's, there's no way it could have happened. The way things were going, Celtic wouldn't have thrown that away with what would have been about seven or eight games left at that stage. There's no way we would have lost that at that point in time with who we'd have to play. They may have beat us in a game we had to play them, but ultimately I think we would have got the points and we'd be fine. The Scottish Cup would get moved to when it would be safe for fans to be back because the original estimate was, oh, fans should be back in stadiums by the end of the calendar year. So we'll play the semi-finals and the final of the Scottish Cup next season at Hamden in front of Full House because SFA basically want their ticket revenue. That's essentially why they were doing that. So that was put on the back burner. So that was something we'll deal with when we do the next episode. Uh, but yeah, obviously the vote came in and we were awarded the title. Hearts were relegated. Obviously Rangers and Hearts made the most noise. And then there was an incident involving a Dundee invoice. Liam, are you familiar with this story at all on social media? No. So a Celtic fan, a wee sneaky Celtic fan out there on Twitter thought, I'm going to reel them in with a belter here. I'm going to I'm going to cast the line out and I'm just going to reel them in. So he did a mock-up of like an invoice from Celtic to Dundee because it was talk that Dundee were the last team to vote and they were the deciding vote, essentially. And apparently they are meant to have voted one way and then it mysteriously changed. This was the stories were doing the round. So he jumped on this and he put this invoice out there making it look like Celtic had paid off Dundee. And he put it out online or leaked it, you know, one of the types of things and WhatsApp groups and what. And he began doing the rounds and notorious Rangers Twitter moon howler under the name of Joe Black. Connor don't know who that is, I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. He jumped all over that and he was talking about, oh, you know, smoking gun evidence. In fact, I believe Rangers talked about having a dossier with smoking gun evidence that kind of went nowhere. And I'm pretty sure this was what their evidence was. Because eventually the guy who did it just kind of admitted yeah, it was all fake. I just thought I would wind you all up and make it look like it was true. And they took it hook, line, and sinker. Uh, but yeah, that actually happened. It was the power of social media, really. Liam. Okay, no, I mean, <laughs> Rangers, for a team that's like staunch and full of dignity and all that, you don't have to get emotional. Or, mm -hmm. you know, boring, hysterical at times, you know. You know, Steven Gerrard, like any time there's a slight against them, the reaction is just, it's not what you expect from grown men and women, you know. And, mm -hmm. You know, at, at that point as well, the dossier and you know, I, was, I think it was Ali McCoy was out there again. He was shouting for names and all that, and it just <laughs> all in there. And I remember the part after that as well. It's like, oh, I, we could have, if we hadn't ripped up our pitch, we'd have, oh, you know, you were frightened there. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, you can't have it both ways. We were not in the ascendancy at that point. We were firing you no know, cylinders, and they were they were still struggling under the pressure. And I do remember that Tav thing that came out when he said, mm -hmm. yeah, good. they're not good when the pressures are not good under pressure. And you can see that. And I think that I admits from their captain. I think until they get rid of them, mm -hmm. they'll never be good under pressure because he gets pressured a lot. And under pressure, he doesn't do well. Aye. No, he's admitting it still comes back to holding them to this day. And of course, funny enough, in a season where there was no fans to keep pressure mm -hmm. on them from the stands, isn't it convenient that they suddenly played pretty well? So, hmm, yeah, but, but yeah, Connor, what do you remember of the Dundee invoice debacle and the hilarity that followed around it? That's just what I remember the hilarity, and it's the it feeds into their um, they, they call us say uh, conspiracy theorists and that, but yeah. they seem to believe that there's this inherent biased against Rangers and that like <laughs> the people want them to want to punish them all the time and it's like it's not that it's just he's at a fucking football club run by absolute morons and he's he's a <laughs> very very unlikable it's like mm -hmm. it's the whole thing is they they say is like they they're saying is no one likes us we don't care but as soon as people will clearly evidently don't like them they like to we have care. a cry about it do you know what I mean Aye. like they're, they're such a a feeble, weak fan base, and they, mm -hmm. you know, it's the same thing as that wee fucking cunt Steely, who looks like a walking thumb. He uh, was put a post last night about. Uh, I seen that. I know. About how, how loving, loving that uh, the fact that England beat Scotland, and he's the same wee fanny that turned up turned Real Madrid, 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 Madrid top to, to support right. Madrid and that. Yeah, like, these people are just fucking moon units, man. They're just they're, <laughs> they're absolute. Uh, uh, do you know what I think it is? I think it's all the inbreeding that messes with our brain. Genuinely, <laughs> I think that's what it does to them. It funny fucks them up a bit, man. Uh, but yeah. I, just, I was, I was, I was amazing just seeing the the absolute implosion and the uh, the 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 
the mental gymnastics that these mm. wallopers were trying to come up with on Twitter and even in the media and that, you know, it's like because you, we all know, we all know that the media is Rangers minded, they're all Rangers fans, they all prefer Rangers, Sky prefer Rangers to Celtic, and it's it's been known for years, right? And they were like, oh, we've got the evidence, we've mm. got the evidence that Celtic are up to no good, and mm. they're cheating, and it all turns out to be this this fake, it turns out to be like a, a huh? practical joke, mm. and they're just there with like about 20 eggs on their faces, Aye. because they, they, just, they just took an it. egg on his face, <laughs> they just, they just they <laughs> took it, and they ran with it, and it's so funny, Aye. just to see the reaction that they got from that, and it's, honestly, it's, I, I loved it. It was great. It was the icing on the cake for, you know, the fact that we it was we couldn't you know celebrate in person. We're in the I league, know. and you know, know we we couldn't finish off the treble technically that season. Mm. So having that was just was just, uh, brilliant, and it, uh, there's it's just it's, a, it's in the long list of the mm. the banter era for for us yeah. taking the piss out of them, which you know. Mm. We I'd, do quite I'd, a lot. I'd, I'd, well, I'd say it's still going on. I genuinely would. I mean, look, they won a league title during COVID when nobody was there and, and people were dying of a deadly disease. And, the, you know, they they somehow, uh, you know, every other team uh, in the country was sending their COVID results to to this uh, this place. And for some reason, they get to send theirs over to a, a facility mm. in Belfast, you know. So, I mean, if there's any shenanigans been going on in terms of COVID and stuff like that, I mean, they might want to take a, uh, a look closer to home, but mm. um, I digress on that. Yeah, just yeah. get up them. Yeah, essentially that's it. Because uh, yeah, much as they can crow about how this season ended and how they were the victims and Hearts as well moaning, they get relegated, obviously. And they said that no team suffered more in this than us. Because as you said there, Connor, we missed out on the celebrations. Obviously, 10 in a row was the ultimate goal at the end of this, but nine in a row was us equaling the record that we set back in the 60s, which for some reason uh, I, I learned that a lot of fans seem to forget that a lot of their fans, you know, when they talk about, oh, we won nine in a row in the 90s, and it's like, yeah, we we done that first. Celtic did it first, just like the new song in the musical. Celtic did it first in the 1960s <laughs> through the 70s. Celtic did that nine in a row. So you equaled us in the 90s, but it's like, well, it'd be amazing for us fans in person to be able to celebrate winning nine in a row again, that's phenomenal. No team in world football has won nine titles in a row twice. And we've get denied that opportunity to see that in person and celebrate it properly because of what was going on. So they say they can get crow about their being victims and they'll get a chance to play the league title race out. I mean, if you want to look, well, obviously, one of Russell's favourite words on here, the era de Vichy, the way he says it, the, the way they ended their league, they did a vote as well. Ajax were awarded the title on goal difference ahead of AZ Alkmaar. Goal difference, they were tied on 56 points each. And I can imagine the difference. fucking you imagine the Aye. reaction would have happened if that was us. Hi, we were Jesus. 13 boys in front. That was a goal difference. They decided that and they're talking about how they were have done by it. It's like look what happened in Holland. It's like, come on, man. It's like that's what happened to you is mild in comparison. But yeah, we get denied obviously the chance to celebrate uh what would have been a phenomenal achievement, nine titles in the bounce, a, a third treble in a row. You know, which would have been a record in itself as well. So we we get missed missed it and all that. And unfortunately for us, the way the next calendar year's about to go, it's only going to get worse for us, sadly. But that, of course, is another story for the next episode of Nostalgia, which will probably be in two weeks because we do this rotation thing now with Judgment Day. So yeah, that'll be the next one. It's the I've been putting it off for a while, but I'm going to roll up my sleeves. I'm going to swallow my pride, and I'm going to get on with it. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the ill-fated Terry Monroe season, uh, 2020, <laughs> the 21, no, 2020, season. God, too many twenties going on here. But yeah, um, but the records will show at the end for this season, as much as they'll say, oh, 8.75 in a row. No, no, no. The records show who won the league, Celtic. Who won the league cup, Celtic. And who won the Scottish what the, cup. What does that Celtic. mean for all the titles that they won when there was fucking world wars going on? Oh. <laughs> when oh, seasons hey. got called early then? <laughs> just, exactly. These people are fucking thick as dug shit, man. Oh, fucking they chill. are. They are. But, but I say, that'll be another story for the next one when we delve into the, the full COVID season. This was only a partial COVID season. And it's a very, very strange world we're about to enter in 2020. Oh boy, going to be some PTSD coming up in that episode. But anyway, before we go, before we finish up, guys, we will uh, go back to the, the trivia from the top of the show. So I basically asked Christopher Julian, he outscored Ryan Kent this season, both £7 million signings. Well, 
allegedly, I don't know how many installments it took for them to pay up seven million. They're probably still paying Liverpool to this day, let's be honest. Uh, but yeah, he outscored uh, Ryan Kent that season. Seven goals in all competitions. Do you know who the seven goals were against, guys? Uh, well, two of them are obvious. Rangers. <laughs> yeah. Rangers, Cluj. No Cluj, no. Uh, oh, sorry, no Cluj, fuck. Uh, Lazio. Yes, so they're the St- obvious ones. <laughs> St. Johnston? No, St. Johnston, no. St. Mirren? And not St. Mirren, no. Motherwell. Got- and not Motherwell, neither. <laughs> We're just going to go around the league, aren't we? Until we get them. <laughs> Hamilton? Yeah, he scored against Hamilton, I think. Is this the one when Johnny Hayes took the quick throw in by jumping over the advertising barrier, grabbed mm-hmm. the ball, took a throw in, we swung it in, and I uh, Julian heads it in. But yeah, he scores against Hamilton Ackies at New Douglas Park. Definitely scores there. Uh, Hearts? Yeah, he scored against Hearts in a 5 0 victory at Celtic Park. Yeah, Hibs? That one. Not Hibs, nope. Mm. Who am I um, Only a couple now you're missing. One of the big ones in Scottish football you missed. Aberdeen. Yeah, Aberdeen in a 2 1 victory. A plastic pitch he scored on. But Livingston. One. Not Livy. Another one. Kelly then. Come on, Come on, look. And the final one was from a European game. Rens. Mm-hmm. Not Ren. No, wasn't he then? He scored against AIK Solna, Stockholm, and the qualifier, the Europa League qualifier. We beat them 4 1. He scored out there. So, yeah, seven goals came against Aberdeen, Kilmarnock, Hamilton, Aki's Hearts, Rangers, AIK, Solna, and Lazio. But, yeah, not a bad return. Seven goals for a seven million pound man and a centre back outscoring their uh, super exciting forward that they signed from Liverpool that they were all raving about. And some still say to this day they should still have kept them. <laughs> but anyway, they yeah, say that wraps up this one. So, yeah, uh, that's uh, this episode now uh, in the books. Thanks for jumping on, Connor, as well. Uh, late notice, but you did obviously message me yesterday, and I was like, I'll let you know, mate. And uh, yeah, you were there on hand, you were there, and you were always there, mate. And oh. was, uh, it's all he wants to say, <laughs> but yeah, I said, Oh, so Liam, are you looking forward to the next one? We talk about the the dumpster fire season of uh, <laughs> 10 in a row. Are you looking forward <laughs> to that one? But you know what, they, they ones are always more fun because you know it's like, a lot to talk about. Yeah, you only gloat about winning so much, right? Yeah. One good chance for us to examine our board and our just oh, some yeah. of look at some of the frailties and the fallacies we tell each other about Celtic to make us keep supporting the team. But there was quite a few there, and, and some of the cracks now are still cracked today. So yes. you yes, can see are. sort of like an avatar to which what we sort of come. Later, you know, so ah, yes, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll cross that one in a couple of weeks, but yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Also, hit that like button on the way out and uh, do all that other good stuff that I talk about at the top of the show. And yeah, tomorrow night, uh, TNF will be back, uh, first night forum will get you ready as the weekend and Celtics return is imminent against Dundee at the weekend, so yeah, we'll have that. I'll be back on as well on Friday night for that Friday feeling ahead of the game to uh, preview it because I'm choking to. For Celtic to be back, you know, I had my fun with international stuff, but yeah, that game last night was depressing in the end. So it's like it reminded me what it's like to be a Scotland fan. So I was like, yeah, come on, Celtic are back soon. So yeah, looking forward to that. So yeah, guys, tune in tomorrow night. TNF will be back as normal, and uh, we shall catch you later, guys. And uh, thanks for watching. See you. Bye, guys. Bye.